Obviously, though, um, Canada is founded on um, two racist property concepts. Uh, one is a doctrine of discovery, and the other one is uh, terra nullius. <clears throat> that was one of the first recommendations of the $55 million Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples uh, uh, that was commissioned by uh, Brian Moroni. Uh, that was one of the first recommendations, was to get rid of those doctrines <clears throat> in use in negotiations by governments and also uh, the use of the governments of, in courts as um, justification for continued theft of lands and resources from First Nations. <clears throat> so with that being the origins of Canada and how its ter territory uh, territorial claims started, um, you know, they never advanced that view towards the First Nations uh, when they made contact uh, with the Haudenosaunee. Um, you know, the beginning of the treaty-making process in North America really started, you know, with Europeans. <clears throat> started with the two or wampum. It was wampum belts that were the first treaties. Um, and first with the Dutch and then later with the British. And that treaty relationship evolved into um, what we call the covenant chain relationship later on, you know, between the British and the, the Haudenosaunee. But in um, 1760, um, the British wanted the alliance of the indigenous nations when they were moving on Montreal to conquer the French. And because the indigenous nations controlled the waterways, um, they asked for them to be neutral. So there was a treaty at Aswagachi that was made in 1760 of, you know, peace and friendship. And when they conquered uh, Montreal, uh, there was another treaty at Gunawage in 1760. And the nations uh, that were represented there were basically the, sometimes it's called the Seven uh, Nations Confederacy, sometimes the Nine Nations, depending on how you count. But um, it was basically the uh, Christianized Indians around uh, the former French allies who um, became allies with the British. And um, that, you know, led to the Royal Proclamation of 1763, where <clears throat> promises were made not to allow settlers to trespass on Indian lands. And um, that led to, I think, one of the most significant treaties in Canada, which is the Niagara Treaty of 1764, because that brought thousands and thousands of um, First Nations representatives uh, to Niagara Falls uh, to enter into um, a treaty with the British. And it brought the Haudenosaunee together with the Anishinaabe nations. And that's what I find significant is that's, and that was under the covenant chain relationship. Now that was respected, uh, you know, until after, you know, the War of 1812 when, um, Indians started to be outnumbered by settlers and weren't as big a military threat as they were previously, which is why those treaties were made. You, know, you wanted to keep peace. And um, that's when you start to see the relationship shift to one of um, trying to assimilate Indians and, um, you know, uh, and their rights, despite the promises that were made, you know, from the 1700s, those treaties and the Royal Proclamation. And um, treaties were made um, subsequent to that, you know, uh, across Ontario. You know, you've got quite a few treaties that were made. Um, the Robinson-Huron treaties, you know, um, 1850, uh, Robinson-Superior. But at the same time, those treaties are being made in, uh, across Ontario. <clears throat> You're starting to see pre-Confederation legislation, you know, to control Indians and, you know, set up reserves and things like that. There was... Uh, you know, a law in Lower Canada, now Quebec, uh, where they set up a, about 11 reserves out of a, an act that was passed, including the Manawaki Reserve just north of here and um, Temiskaming Reserve over on the, the west side. Um, there was um, 11 reserves altogether that were carved out of that legislation. And um, then you get the Indian Act after Confederation, which consolidated all that pre-Confederation legislation into what's called the Indian Act, and that act, that law is still in place today. And that's the main law that's been used to control and manage Indians, um, you know, since, uh, well, the mid-1800s, because like I said, it started, the legislation started to be developed around uh, 1850. Um, but the Indian Act um, 
you know, was the, amended from time to time. It's still in place now. Um, but one of the amendments was um, in the 1920s when Descahe, Levi General, um, started to go to the League of Nations and demand that the Haudenosaunee be recognized as nations. Uh, he returned home, you know, the, the British and Canada stopped him, um, you know, from advancing that at the League of Nations, that, that position. He came home and they wouldn't let him back into Canada. He died in uh, Tuscarora um, from pneumonia, I believe. <clears throat> he never did make it back home. And that was around the time that the RCMP padlocked <clears throat> the longhouses to force the elective system into six nations. They did the same thing at Akwazesne, uh, same thing in Gunawage, and that's how they imposed the elective system in you know the Iroquois communities. And um, you know they started passing laws. Uh, I think in 1880, the laws to advance the civilization of Indians or something like that. I can't remember the exact title, but again, it was all related to the Indian Act, and it was all about assimilating Indians because the Indian Act kind of had two schizophrenic goals. One was to protect Indians from settlers until they could become enfranchised or fit for citizenship. The other was to assimilate them. And so those two competing purposes of the act, you know, have um, kind of remained in the legislation. And to a certain extent, that's why, um, well, the Indian Act, you know, uh, was amended in the 1920s, you know, around the time, like I said, when they padlocked the longhouses. But the other thing they did was they made it illegal through amendments to the act for Indians to hold ceremonies, uh, to have meetings, uh, to hire a lawyer, to protect land rights. That's when you see a lot of um, traditional governments go underground. Because, uh, and that's when you see a lot of our material culture stolen, you know, and put into museums where they stole wampum belts and out west, they stole masks, you know, out of BC, uh, longhouses, uh, um, headdresses from the prairies, all kinds of um, material culture they took, which represented our governance systems, because they wanted to, you know, assimilate us in under the Indian Act, and so they went after our traditional systems of governance. And like I said, they didn't um, kill them off, but they had to go underground because, you know, otherwise you'd wind up in jail. You know, because there were Indian agents, a system of Indian agents at the time watching what, you know, the chief and councils, the elective chief and councils that they put in place, they were under supervision from Ottawa through an Indian agent system. And they told them, you know, they drafted the BCRs, told them what to sign, and, you know, you know the residential schools are just the tip of the iceberg of, uh, you know, the control that Ottawa has placed on Indians. Uh, the true story hasn't even come out about the impacts the Indian Act has had, you know, the devastating impacts it's had on First Nations. You know, there's 633 bands in Canada, each one has its own fact situation about, you know, whether they embraced or resisted the application of the Indian Act um, over them, themselves and their, their lands. Anyway, there was uh, amendments uh, that were in the Indian Act from the 1920s. <clears throat> they amended it again in 1951 and removed them. Um, bit of uh, relaxing of the, um, you know, the uh, the repressive measures that they had, you know, against uh, tradition. They figured that they, you know, they had done the job. So they, uh, I think, with the help of the churches, uh, the churches helped convince the government to um, to put new amendments in, um, which I mean, to remove those amendments that were in there from the 1920s. And you know, that starts to bring us up into the relatively, well, the post-war era, you know, 1960s and that, the Indian Act was still there. First court cases you start to see uh, in Canada around that time is, you know, over hunting and fishing charges where Indians were arguing they had treaty rights or, you know, Aboriginal rights. If you look at the case law, those are the first cases that start to emerge. Uh, the Indian Eskimo Association was formed around then, you know, to help support uh, uh, Indigenous peoples. Um, that turned into the Canadian uh, Association of Support of Native Peoples, CASNIP. Uh, that was around up until the 80s, I think, that organization. Um, throughout the 70s, you know, there was a lot of activism for Indian rights. Uh, um, George Manuel uh, was the president of National Indian Brotherhood. Well, I'm jumping ahead here. 1969, uh, Jean Chrétien, uh, as Minister of Indian Affairs, Pierre Trudeau, uh, as Prime Minister introduced what's called the White Paper on Indian Policy. 
and this being Ottawa, I guess most of you know white papers are policy papers. <coughs> and um, so he introduced it as a, well, it's actually like a discussion paper on policy, a white paper. But he called it a white paper on Indian policy, and um, they had had a series of consultations with um, uh, representatives of the, the First Nations uh, throughout 1968. And um, they came up with this white paper, and it proposed repealing the Indian Act, um, amending the British North America Act to remove any reference to Indians and lands reserved for Indians, getting rid of reserves, ending the treaties. Um, you know, there were a number of measures in there that basically their argument was, you know, what's holding Indians back from being equal to other Canadians is their special status. So it had to be removed. And um, that's what they proposed. And of course, the reaction from First Nations across the country was outraged because I guess, you know, during the consultations, they'd been saying, what about our Aboriginal treaty rights? You know, they weren't talking about the Indian Act. They were talking about their Aboriginal treaty rights. You know, how come you're not respecting them? Because the Indian Act ignored those and imposed a system on top of everybody of governance and control. So they ignored what they'd heard from the Indians and decided, you know, internally that this was the best thing was to finish off the assimilation process, you know, that they'd started in, you know, 100 years earlier. And, um, of course, the reaction, like I said, was outrage, and that's when First Nations organized across the country. And, um, you know, went after, uh, kind of like you're saying now, with I don't know more, it was, uh, except they didn't have uh, smartphones and <laughs> Twitter and, you know, YouTube and Facebook. So they had to organize the old-fashioned way, you know, traveling around with cars and, you know, getting meetings together and stuff. But what they did was they went after the government and um, different organizations were formed. That's when um, you see the National Union Brotherhood being formed, uh, the Union of BC Indian Chiefs, um, Indians of Quebec Association, um, Manitoba Indian Brotherhood, you know, all these regions produced uh, these organizations, political organizations to advocate <laughs> for uh, Indian rights. And um, The Indians of Alberta Association, led by Harold Cardinal, who was a young leader at the time, um, presented Trudeau, and I think it was in 1971, with a red paper, you know, to counter the white paper. <laughs> and it set out, you know, their demands for respect for treaties and everything. And, um, you know, that led to the government saying, okay, we're going to fund your organization so you can advocate to us and tell us what your, your positions are on your rights. And that's what led to the funding of the, the current organizations you see today. The Assembly of First Nations was reorganized from the National Indian Brotherhood. Um, but that's what it was. Those organizations were formed to fight the white paper uh, proposals. Now, on the government side, Trudeau publicly said he was withdrawing the white paper, but, you know, um, I've seen documents internal to Indian Affairs, you know, from at least the uh, assistant deputy minister level saying, you know, we just need to remove the time frame because they said they were going to do all that within five years. They said, we just need to remove the time frame, and instead of focusing on, you know, removing the special status of Indians, we won't talk about that. We'll focus on the other elements. And so that's what they've been doing, is they've been getting programs and services to be delivered by chiefs and councils more and more instead of by Ottawa, so that the chief and council system is now kind of middlemen, you know, the band offices uh, um, operating under the terms and conditions written up by Ottawa. So all the funding is controlled by them. And... Um, you know, there's lots of talk about uh, corrupt chiefs and, uh, you know, a lot of money. I would say there are definitely chiefs that are way, making way too much money. But those are few. Out of the 633, I'd say, I don't know, maybe 15 or 20, I'm guessing. Um, nobody needs to earn a million dollars a year, you know. I don't think. I don't care what you're doing. Um... But, you know, there was a case in Nova Scotia where a chief was getting paid that, you know, a small band. Um, those things, I think, need to be uh, sorted out. But the thing about, um, well, I'll go back to my chronology here. Um, so, you know, throughout the 70s was the, was the activism, you know, fighting over from the white paper and... Um, Trudeau came 
<clears throat> and I remember I was a student in Trent University at the time I came down. There was a chief's meeting in 1980. Um, the Delta Hotel was called um, the Skyline, I think, at the time. I'm giving away my age here. <laughs> <laughs> and um, <clears throat> Trudeau was speaking to the chiefs, and I rem distinctly remember him saying, because he was talking about it, he wanted to patriot the Constitution. And this is before he actually started, and he said, I'm asking you to treat Canada better than Canada's treated you, he said. I remember him saying that. And he was imploring the chiefs to support his, you know, effort to patriate the Constitution. And of course that led to the negotiations between the premiers and, you know, the prime minister. Gretchen was the justice minister, our friend from the white paper days. And um, in the horse trading between the provinces and the federal government, uh, there was a section that recognized and affirmed Aboriginal treaty rights in the Constitution. They removed it. And that really... Uh, and there was a debate amongst, you know, First Nations whether we should be in the new constitution or not, but the majority felt we should be in there. Our rights should be in there. If they're going to have a new constitution, they should enshrine our rights in that constitution. Because, you know, I've heard some people say, well, it's their constitution, it's not ours and that, but I think the ones that wanted it in the constitution were right, because if there was no reference to it in there, it gives them a blank check to basically say, well, you know, you don't have any constitutional rights. The only rights you have is... 9124. And so I guess that's the way I see it, is we have an old constitution and a new constitution. The old constitution was, you know, the colonial one, BNA Act, now called the Constitution Act 1867. 9124, that section, you know, basically that constitution created the division of powers between provinces and the federal government. So there's two orders of government in Canada under that constitution, which was an act of the British Parliament. That was Canada's first constitution. So under the federal powers, that's how they created the Indian Act, because they had powers over Indians and lands reserved for Indians, section 9124. And um, that's what led to the Indian Act in 1876, after you know the 1867 constitution. So that's the colonial constitution. The fight for the, the new constitution, you know, um, Indigenous peoples called Aboriginal peoples in the in the Constitution, you know, Indians, uh, Inuit, and Métis. Um, it was removed, and there was a big fight. Indians across the country mobilized. You know, all Aboriginal groups did. The Métis, uh, the Inuit, they were angry that they'd removed that section out of the draft Constitution. And uh, I remember um, the Union of BC Indian Chiefs. Uh, they organized what was called a Constitution Express. And people who were on welfare and that, you know, found money to get, because you had to pay your ticket to get on there, you know, they had to pay for the train. And people who were on welfare and that were able to get money in that and get on, tickets to get on the train to go to Ottawa, you know, to tell Trudeau that they wanted that put back in the Constitution, that section. And they did that, and I remember, I was still in university then, and I remember coming and seeing that train pull into town. And, boy, there was lots of Indians in this town that time, and the mayor had to ask... Um, and I think the mayor was the mother of the... Mary yeah. yeah. She was the one that asked um, people in Ottawa to open up their doors because people needed to be billeted because they didn't have money for hotels. <clears throat> and um, anyway, it was a big fight and um, it included, you know, people from B.C. and that and Quebec and that with Aboriginal rights and, you know, it also included um, Indian from treaty nations, you know, who wanted their treaties recognized. In the end, um, you know, I think it was the Saskatchewan and Alberta premiers that had asked for it to be removed. And then in the end, after the protests and the pressure, Blakeney, I think he was the, uh, the premier of Saskatchewan at the time, you know, pushed for it to be put back in. So they put back in Section 35, but when they put it back in, they added a word. And it said, um, the existing Aboriginal treaty rights of Aboriginal peoples are hereby recognized and affirmed. Mm -hmm. So they put that in to try and limit a future interpretation of uh, that section. Um, and um, so when the package was negotiated and they sent it to England to be patriated, some Indians from the prairies and um, I think um, BC went to court to try and stop the patriation in England. Um, but you know, they failed because the court said that, uh, you know, they had the right to patriate the Constitution. But um, 
I seem to recall it was Justice Lord Denning, I think, that gave the decision. And he, at the same time, said that all the promises that were made, uh, you know, should be uh, to uh, Indians should be kept as long as the sun shines and the grass grows. He could use some of the words from the treaties. So they patriated the Constitution. The Queen signed it into law um, April 17th, 1982, you know, up on the hill. Um, I didn't go watch it, but I was in Ottawa. And um, that included in there was a Section 37, which provided for a First Minister's Conference to be held one year on Aboriginal matters to be held one year before one year was up after the Constitution was patriated. So that led to a First Minister's Conference on Aboriginal Matters in 1983. And, um, you know, there were First Nations protesting outside who didn't agree with that process, with the provinces being involved on First Nations matters, because historically it was, you know, the federal government. Um, but there were others who were inside. Uh, the National Aboriginal Organizations were inside at the table. That was um, Assembly of First Nations. Um, the Métis had a little scrap and went to court, and so they had two groups there, the Native Council of Canada and the Métis National Council. And the Inuit uh, had an organization to, there too. I can't recall what uh, Inuit tap or is that? No, I think they had a, they created a constitutional committee or something, so they were there. So there were four um, Aboriginal, national Aboriginal representatives there with the premiers and the prime minister who was flanked by his Indian Affairs Minister and the Justice Minister. <coughs> and um, the purpose was to identify and define the meaning of Aboriginal treaty rights in Section 35. Um, they agreed to further schedule meetings which required a constitutional amendment of seven provinces with 50% of the population. And under that formula, that means basically you need either to have Ontario or Quebec on side. If you don't have one of those provinces, then you don't have the 50% population quotient. Anyway, they amended it and they added a couple more sections to 35 saying that the laws will be, you know, applied equally to men and women and that for greater certainty, treaties includes any land claims agreements that have been made or may be made. The, the James Bay Cree wanted that in there because they were the first ones to sign a modern treaty in 1975. But they wanted it to be <coughs> constitutionally protected in Section 35, so they pushed for that amendment. And... Um, Instead of the purpose of those meetings, and they agreed to have one in 1985, uh, no, 84, 85, and 87, they agreed to three more meetings. But instead of identifying and defining what the scope of Aboriginal treaty rights were in Section 35, it, there was an agenda list there, and they started to focus on that, and they focused on self-government. Should self-government be inherent, is it an inherent right, or is it a delegated right? Of course, the Aboriginal representative said, well, you know, we've always had it, you know. Uh, of course it's inherent. And they said, no, you should have to negotiate self-government agreements with us, and once you get an agreement, then you have self-government. So, in other words, you know, delegated authority. And so they went round and round on that proposal. Trudeau, you know, did his walk in the snow in 84 and said he wouldn't be around for the next First Minister's Conference because he, you know, retired. And so there was a federal election, and there was a new chairman in 1985, and that was Brian Moroney. And of course, he brought back that idea of you know the delegated, you know, approach to self-government didn't go anywhere. And then in '87, um, while they were at the constitutional table, he started this community-based self-government policy that he was trying to do deals on the side, you know, under legislation, under basically getting creating municipal type governments if you want out of the Indian Act, here's your way out kind of thing. So that was the start of the federal self-government policy uh, away from the constitutional table. But by the time the 1987 um, First Minister's Conference on Aboriginal Matters was held, um, the Aboriginal representatives didn't know that Moroni was in secret talks with uh, Barassa, the Premier of Quebec, uh, over what became the Meech Lake Accord. Um, because Quebec was seeking distinct society status within the Constitution. But they didn't know it at the table. And uh, Barassa didn't even come to the uh, conference. He sent a couple of his ministers. And um, so again, that self-government proposal, you know, was uh, on the table, you know, except a process to negotiate self-government with us and, and you'll have it. 
And basically, uh, the way it was uh, framed, uh, the metaphor that was used during those talks was, we say Section 35 is a full box with all of our rights. Uh, the governments, federal and provincial governments said, no, it's an empty box until we fill it up, you know, with these agreements you have to negotiate with us. Um, of course, that proposition didn't fly in 87. There was no more um, provision for holding first ministers conferences, so it ended in failure, those series of talks throughout the 80s. And um, the definition of Section 35 rights didn't happen, you know. Um, so there was legal and political uncertainty as to what Aboriginal treaty rights were across the country. The first court case that started to define Section 35 came down in the Sparrow case over fishing in uh, 1990. And that's when they started to lay out the test. They said uh, Aboriginal rights aren't absolute. They can be justifiably infringed for a valid legislative objective. And um, that's where they started to, you know, contain the interpretation of Section 35 in law. And um, they also put in there a test that if the Crown governments argued that rights were extinguished, because under Canadian law, prior to 1982, one could unilaterally extinguish Aboriginal rights, and that was it, that's all. But after 1982, consent is required uh, because rights are recognized. And so the court in that Sparrow case said uh, if a Crown government argues that uh, rights were extinguished, then the burden of proof shifts to them. The intent of the Crown was clear and plain to extinguish. Section 35 rights have to be proven basically band by band or group by group. There was no national uh, right to everybody. And um, since then, the courts have laid out, you know, a number of legal tests, you know, about um, Aboriginal title, the Delgama case in 97. Uh, you know, in the, there was a Vanderpeet case in the 90s, um, which said if you're going to which is a really high standard to meet. So that's how they've been laying out interpretations of Section 35. So if a group uh, asserts that it has Aboriginal treaty rights, it has to meet these tests, which costs millions and millions of dollars to collect the evidence and uh, tests. And if you get there, it's a crapshoot whether they're going to rule in Through the courts in BC right now, BC Court of Appeal, um, it's on Aboriginal title with the Chilcotin, said that um, they can't claim vast tracts of land. They can only claim like small areas, small parcels where they actually lived or, you know, had corrals with horses or things like that. But they can't claim a, a national territory, which is what they were doing in court, saying, you know, the boundaries of what their territory was were only the Chilcotin are you know, exclusively the Chilcotin's area. More to this uh, intensity of use argument. You just can't claim large tracts of land. You have to intensively use it. And um, again, it's based on this, you know, doctrine of discovery concept which goes back to the origins of Canada. And uh, I just saw yesterday, I guess, the Supreme Court of Canada gave leave to appeal to hear the case. Um, and that bench, you know, is pretty conservative. Um, and it's also part of the government, in my view. The courts are part of the crown. And to go to court on something as fundamental as that is a risky thing, because if they against Aboriginal title, um, it's going to lead to a lot more and more unrest in the country because, you know, if Aboriginal title wasn't recognized in areas, you know, uh, where it exists, it's going to be a problem. And British Columbia is a big area where it is. Mm -hmm. Quebec is another area. The Maritimes mm -hmm. is another area. Uh, parts of Ontario have not been uh, entered into treaty, so Aboriginal title still exists. So this is where you have the 
why Canada has had policies on land claims and self-government. They've had land claims policies since 1973 when um, the Nishka went to course, court in a Calder case over Aboriginal title. Three judges said they had it, three said they didn't, and the uh, seventh judge said, well, they didn't seek um, um, permission to sue uh, the government from, I think, the lieutenant governor, so they lost on a technicality, but still it was 4-3. But that created enough uncertainty for Trudeau because he was funding mega projects. You know, they wanted to do the pipeline from the Northwest Territories. The James Bay project was, you know, um, preparing to be built. There were a number of large uh, projects going on across Canada, federally funded. So he said maybe they have more rights than I thought they had. And he created the land claims policy where he said comprehensive claims are uh, claims where in areas of Canada where no treaties have been made, you know, historic treaties, uh, land treaties. And uh, specific claims are claims related to lawful obligations, like, you know, if they illegally dispose of reserve lands or Indian lands and trust funds and breaches of treaties and things like that. So they had those land claims um, approaches. That's what the James Bay Agreement uh, was under in 75. Um, you know, that's that specific claims are settled, you know, since the 70s. Um, but in 1995, when uh, Cretchen had a majority government, um, he introduced this uh, Aboriginal self-government policy. And, um, you know, I was, um, in a previous life, I was Vice President of Policy for the Aboriginal Liberal Commission from 1990 to 94, so I was involved in developing the first Red Book and the Aboriginal platform that, you know, they adopted in the 1993 election. There were quite a lot of promises in there that uh, he had agreed to, uh, one was recognizing uh, the inherent right to self-government, you know, premise that it was included in Section 35. But when he formed the government, uh, he had um, the Department of Indian Affairs develop a policy that's an in anything but an inherent right policy. Uh, the 1995 Aboriginal self-government policy, which is the umbrella policy they're using in all negotiations, is premised on um, interpreting Section 35, again, to mean that it's empty unless you get self-government agreements through that policy. So they're saying to groups, if you want out of the Indian Act, which has been controlling you over you know, 125 years, you have to negotiate your way out through this self-government policy. And the self-government policy defines what's on the table and what's not on the table. And what's not on the table was all matters of national interest, you know, things relating to trade and commerce and that. They're not prepared to share any powers in that. It's basically, you know, you have to agree to become a municipal uh, government. And that's only for Indians. For the Métis who don't have a land base, uh, they don't get self-government under that policy. Maybe some administration, but not really self-government. And even the self-government that Indians get under that is delegated authority. If it's in an area of uh, pro provincial uh, constitutional authority, um, the provinces have a veto on the talks, even if it's child welfare, you know, something that you would think is basic and internal to a group. Uh, they have to still negotiate with the provinces and apply provincial standards and the institutions they set up in that. <clears throat> of course, they don't get the same amount of money as Cindy Blackstock would tell you, but, you know, that's the, the way it works under that policy. And some groups have settled for it. The Sea Shout settled an agreement under there in 1984 when it was a community-based self-government approach. Um, the Nishka included it in their treaty when they extinguished Aboriginal title. They agreed to basically become a municipal type government. Um, Golden Lake Band is negotiating that right now to give up their reserve and become a municipal type government and pay taxes and all that. Um, groups in BC are doing that because they're applying the comprehensive claims and self-government policies together. That's the negotiation package people have to to get out of the Indian Act, they have to agree to basically terminate their rights um, to become Canadians. Um, they'll still have some Aboriginal status but under the Constitution, but it'll be more like ethnicity and not real legal or political powers. You know, their legal and political character will be, like I said, municipalities. And during the constitutional talks, you know, around that self-government uh, issue, the argument was being made that there should be a distinct order of Aboriginal government that's recognized with clear uh, powers that would be recognized and clear territories that would be recognized. But under these policies, that doesn't exist. It's to be assimilated under the two existing orders of government, particularly the provinces, to be a municipal level government. And uh, 
there are the Indian Act already because the government controls the membership provisions. They're basically managing the extinction of status Indians through because of the marrying out rate and the amendments that they put in 1985, where eventually there won't be status Indians in certain parts of the country, and so that means there won't be any need for reserves because only Indians can reside on reserves. So basically, because they con constitutionally can't just get rid of reserves, they're doing it through other means. They're also thinking of um, proposing a private ownership uh, bill, which would allow residential lands on reserves to be held in fee simple. Um, and some of the reserves, like in the prairies, were created by treaty. So they're not too happy about that idea, because they feel that's a direct violation of treaty if they're going to try and introduce something like that. Anyway, um, right now, before the House, um, I think there's something like eight bills that are amending the Indian Act, changing it into a, modernizing it, as the euphemism that the Harper government uses, okay. which is uh, basically, you know, to, to use individual rights to undermine the collective rights. That's what their focus has been. And the legislation is designed that way. There's, you know, a thread through all of it, um, you know, to um, gradually get rid of... Um, you know, status Indians and st status Indian lands, um, because not everybody's negotiating it. I think there's 93 tables across the country right now. And in September of last year, they announced three new policy measures, you know, on top of the legislation before the House. Uh, one was um, to introduce what they call this results-based approach. Um, to these negotiations. So these 93 tables, which I haven't counted them up, but I figure it's probably about 300 bands are represented at those 93 tables, which are comprehensive and self comprehensive claims tables for modern treaties, and also self-government tables under those policies. Um, basically, they're saying um, the federal negotiators are assessing each table to determine if it's going to be a productive table or an unproductive table. If it's an unproductive table, then they're going to drop funding for the negotiations and go where they hope to get agreements. And the agreements will base, be based on their termination policies, where you agree to you know, accept being terminated and turned into municipalities um, and terminating the Aboriginal title, because that's, um, that's what the policy is. Uh, I think in the Golden Lake uh, agreement principle that I saw, they're saying Aboriginal title will continue will not, yeah, it says it won't be extinguished, it will continue as modified. It will be modified and continue as modified. But they're modifying it into fee simple lands under Ontario law. So on the one hand, they're telling the Algonquins who have to vote on that, your Aboriginal title won't be extinguished. But on the other hand, they're saying it'll be modified and it'll be modified into fee simple. So, I mean, it's being extinguished. But they're trying to be clever about it, I guess. You know, Brian Crane is the senior negotiator for Ontario, and Ron Deering's the federal negotiator. So I guess they're trying to be slick at trying to get that one by the people. I don't know how they're going to vote, but <coughs> they're supposed to be voting on that this year. Anyway, um, so this results-based approach for these 93 tables is basically forcing groups to decide: are they going to settle under those terms, or you know, walk away from the table? And uh, second measure. I said there were three. Second measure they announced was that they were going to um, cap the funding of provincial territory organizations to 500,000 a year. Um, and those are, you know, the organizations I mentioned, you know, the regional ones like Manitoba, Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs, it used to be the Manitoba Indian Brotherhood, uh, Assembly of First Nations has already been cut. Um, so all these regional organizations who are getting, I think, Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs, I think he said they were getting two point some million they'll be cut to 500,000. And um, so what those cuts mean is that as advocacy groups, they won't be able to cover the travel of chiefs to meet and discuss legislation or policy or you know economic uh, developments on their lands that they may have concerns about, you know, like pipelines or whatever. And um, the third uh, measure they introduced was um, over the next two years getting rid of advisory services which, you know, helps pay for, you know, exactly that, advisors, uh, legal and policy advisors, um, uh, for tribal councils and for bands. And meanwhile, last year alone, you know, to fight Indians, Indian Affairs paid, I think, $110 million just in legal costs. 
Government of Canada overall, I think, paid $500 million out in legal costs with all the departments. So on the one hand, they're saying, well, you don't need advisors and that, you know, just do what we say. Yet they're, you know, retaining their lawyers to fight against Indian rights. Anyway, so that's the framework I'm saying um, is what I call Harper's Termination Plan is it's based on the policy framework of land claims and self-government policies on top of amending the Indian Act to use the Indian Act as an instrument to gradually, you know, get rid of Indians and reserves. And, um, you know, it's an objective that comes out of the white paper. Um, they've been going at it for the last 40-some years, well, longer than that if you take the Indian Act from its origins. And, um, you know, I don't know more, started uh, protesting around bills, the omnibus bills, C-38 and C-45. Um, and C-45 was the one which was relaxing, um, you know, measures to surrender or designate land, reserve lands for economic purposes. Um, and that means, you know, they could do it with just whoever shows up at a meeting instead of now. It requires, you know, over 50% of the registered band to vote yes. And it requires a cabinet uh, order, too. So they're reducing it to just say uh, the majority of who shows up at a meeting where a notice is given and the minister can sign off on it. And um, of course there's going to be more, and more pressure on bands to use their reserve lands for economic purposes because they're cutting back on programs and services. And um, the other aspect is the Navigable Waters Act, the removal of lakes and rivers, which will affect you know, Aboriginal treaty rights. Um, you know, when you don't have ha protection for the waters and for the habitat around there. And <clears throat> those are big issues, but in my view, that's just the tip of the iceberg again because, you know, they've got eight bills amending the act and, um, you know, other bills affecting the environment and, um, and the policy framework on top of it. So the larger termination plan, I haven't heard the founders of I Don't Know More mention that. I know that people around it are starting to talk about it because I've written about it and they're reading that. But I haven't really seen any real analysis coming out of them about what is really the Harper agenda on First Nations. I don't think they've, uh, they've got it yet because um, it's, it's big. And, um, you know, I don't know more started in November with a teach-in, as I understand it, in Saskatoon by these four women. Uh, three of them are coming to Ottawa this weekend. I've never met them. They're law students, I think. Um, you know, I think they, they deserve a lot of credit for starting it, but they're definitely not in charge of anything anymore because, you know, everybody's using I don't know more for their local demands, and it's, it's gone pretty wide. What I've been promoting is, you know, I don't know more, K-N-O-W. That's what I said that they need to do because, you know, I watched a lot of protesters there, you know, talk about our land and sovereignty and treaties but they didn't really know the details of Bill C-45 and that, that they were out there protesting. So I thought, <clears throat> you know, and besides, I, you know, like I said, I think it's more than just those bills. So that's why I thought I don't know more and needed to know more about what they're up against. Um, anyway, um, so they started around November and then Chief Spence started her hunger strike in December. A lot of the I don't know more movements kind of focused around her demands, and um, you know, for a meeting. Uh, finally, there was a meeting on January 11th. A lot of uh, confusion around it. Uh, one was that um, AFN, instead of demanding that the prime minister come to a venue to accommodate all the chiefs, because that was an issue during the crown gathering, they didn't like the fact the prime minister's office was saying, "Okay, we're going to limit who can come to the meeting." And that put the onus on the chiefs, you know, from the regions, who can come and who can't come. And uh, so there was a lot of resentment left over amongst a lot of the chiefs about that experience. Plus the baggage of the fact that, you know, he didn't do anything. The prime minister didn't follow up on the commitments out of that meeting. That didn't help Sean Atlio, you know, because nobody trusted Harper, you know, well, very few. Maybe the ones making deals with him. But other than that, a lot of the chiefs didn't trust him. So that was one of the issues that he was faced going into that January 11th meeting, and they were all meeting at the Delta. I was there watching all the drama unfold. And um, the other one was Chief Spence asking the chiefs not to go because the Governor General wasn't going to be there. And what she had, her demand, 
what she made pretty early on was she wanted a meeting of all the the First Nations chiefs and uh, and the Prime Minister and the Governor General. Of course, they had to press a uh, former national chief, my former boss, Ovid McCurdy, into service, and he was trying to get them to agree to the larger venue and to um, get the Governor General involved. Well, the Prime Minister only agreed, you know, to have the Governor General do the ceremonial thing after the so-called working meeting, where I think they only allowed 30 people in. And, you know, the night before, everybody was getting up and saying, well, I'm not going to the meeting, I'm going to support Chief Spence and boycott the meeting. And that's what started to put the heat on Atlio and, and the AFN executive. And um, even some of the AFN executives said they weren't going to go in. Uh, Perry Belgard from Saskatchewan was one, I think, and Bill Erasmus from the Denny Nation didn't go. But, you know, two went in from each region, a couple of chiefs from Nova Scotia. When I looked at the delegation that went in, a lot of them were at these, you know, 93 tables, or were representing the 93 tables. Um, and um, they had eight demands when they went in there. Uh, one was, you know, a treaty process, uh, treaty implementation process. One is comprehensive claims re uh, reform process. Um, and a national inquiry on murdered and missing women, uh, school and every reserve, um, you know, a section 35 analysis against C45 uh, and 38 and all federal legislation. Um, you know, there was a couple of others in there. Um, I think economic development was in there somewhere because that's Harper's priority. Um, but all they got was a so-called high-level process. And um, there's a difference between policy and process. And um, he didn't get any commitments to changes to the legislation, which is what I don't know more had been asking for. And um, he didn't get any commitments to the school or the national inquiry, you know. Basically, he, he walked out of there. Uh, you know, with a process. And this is what the baggage hanging over from the Crown First Nations gathering where you had a process agreed to there, which wasn't followed up on. And the thing I think is telling is the fact that he didn't ha go and have a news conference after the meeting to, to announce the results. Uh, he went on a couple of shows later on that night, but he did. Every, there was a lot of people, elders and First Nations people and chiefs waiting at the Delta. They were told that AFN was going to come back and report the results of the meeting. Mm -hmm. Well, they never did. They released the room. And they told people they had to get out of the room. And luckily, there were some rooms upstairs that regional organizations still had retained. And that's where people were being herded up to there. But they never did get a report from AFN on the results of that meeting, which, again, I think is telling because he didn't have a lot to report. And, uh, of course, he got sick right after that. And... Um, he did look sick, uh, I'll give him that, when I saw him that week. He was under a lot of stress. But unfortunately, you know, he didn't achieve much, and um, Chief Spence continued her fast until she got this statement of commitment from the opposition parties and the national chief. <clears throat> but with all due respect to Chief Spence, I'm glad she's, you know, stopped her hunger strike because I, I was getting worried about her. But that statement's not going to mean a whole heck of a lot um, because Harper has a majority in Parliament. And they're opening back up on Monday. And, um, you know, I don't know what the opposition parties are going to do with these 13 commitments. I guess raise them in question period. That's about all they could do. But um, a lot of this isn't resolved. That started, I don't know more. You know, the, the legislation that's started it uh, <clears throat> hasn't been uh, agreed to be amended. Um, the larger issues of murdered and missing women, which I'm hearing a figure of 6,000 now, um, isn't being addressed by the federal government. He doesn't feel an inquiry is necessary. Um, they're continuing. I mean, when John Duncan came out that night, he announced that as far as they're concerned, they followed the Constitution with the legislation and everything's all okay. That's what he said January 11th. And they're still going on this results-based approach for these 93 tables, which are basically termination tables as far as I'm concerned. And um, that's where we're at. You know, um, I don't know about what the grassroots are going to do or understand about... Uh, the fact that Harper hasn't budged from, you know, when they started moving in November, uh, except for this high-level process. 
I will say this, though, um, that in the 1970s, when George Manuel was um, president of the National Union Brotherhood, and anybody who wants to research this can look into it, um, Trudeau invited him to a joint NIB cabinet committee process. And um, George Manuel pulled out of it because Trudeau was just using it as a rubber stamp for federal policies. So that was a previous, you know, because they're talking about a cabinet process here. The problem with that is, you know, if you don't agree to what the process is about, are you going to get rid of these policies? Because that's what, you know, I'll use comprehensive claims or Aboriginal title as an example. The policy is to extinguish Aboriginal title. Um, meanwhile, the Constitution says it's supposed to recognize uh, and affirm Aboriginal and treaty rights, yet the policy is to deny and extinguish. So they need to get the government to do a 180 and say, okay, we, these agreements are going to recognize and affirm Aboriginal title. You know, like under the city of Ottawa, here it's Algonquin title. Why is it that Crown title and Algonquin title can't coexist if you reach, you know, terms of an agreement about co-management or coexistence or whatever, or mutually recognized title? I mean, I don't know why it is, except that they don't want to share anything with Aboriginal peoples. They want the Crown to have sovereignty and control over everything. That's the only reason I, I can think of why they, they won't change their policies. And a lot of it's the federal bureaucracy. I mean, the politicians come and go, but the bureaucracy is, you know, the real government. And like I said, they, had, they were the ones that were saying, we'll just change the time frame on the white paper and we'll continue with it. We just won't talk about, you know, changing the Indian status publicly and we'll, we'll prolong the time frame. And that's what they're doing. I mean, now there's so much federal dependency on the money. They're using the money to control our leadership and uh, basically go along with assimilating us and getting the chief and councils to maintain the discontent of their members. Because if you don't work at the band office, you know, in a lot of the communities, there's no jobs. That's why you see more and more people fighting over trying to get control of chief and council and the band office. Because that's the economy for a lot of communities. Particularly in remote and you know rural areas and isolated communities. Anyway, that's uh, I don't know if I covered what you want me to cover, but that's my uh, my overview, I guess, of um, our situation. Very helpful. And uh, if anybody has questions or comments, I guess. Thank you, Russell.